I solemnly swear that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Yeah, hi everybody. Ron here from The Truth About Addiction. Welcome to another episode. Hope everybody's well. Um, today's guest is Anthony. He's not only in recovery and look, doing good stuff, but he's also a personal friend of mine. You know, Anthony's quite welcome to come to my home and that doesn't come to many people. And I only say that the people who I trust and I believe motivation and intentions are really good, you know. So welcome, Anthony. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me, mate. My pleasure, brother. So what's the Anthony story, brother? The Anthony story. <laughs> Put me on the spot. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting, mate, because I share this um, from time to time these days. And as things have progressed, it, my view on it has changed. But I guess to cut a quite a long story short, I um, I grew up in what I be believed to be a kind of normal kind of middle class family, um, had every opportunity, I guess. Um, we weren't, you know, well off, but we also weren't struggling. Uh, I, 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 you know, by all accounts, my life was quite normal. Yeah. And then I remember getting to an age, there are a couple of key events through, through my life, nothing that really made a big difference to, to me at the time that I could consciously be aware of. But I remember getting to about 12 years old and starting to have an interest, you know, a bit of an interest in, oh, the, the older kids smoking pot, you know, <laughs> or the older, the, what's this wine thing that people are doing or drinking or whatever. And then I remember at about that age, about 13 years old, um, smoking pot and then drinking wine and having an effect straight away, like getting an effect from it. And for me, it just felt like the lights came on inside of my head and inside my body. It was just like, like the best way I can describe it is like, holy shit, how long has this been going on? Yeah. yeah? Because this just feels so great. And I felt like I could be myself. I felt confident. Um, and it was only then that I realized prior, that, that when I wasn't on them, that maybe I lacked some confidence or maybe I lacked some, you know, feeling of just feeling safe to be myself or some certainty within myself because prior to that, it was just normal, you know? Um, and so, and, and mate, it was really weird because I remember using that first time smoking pot and it was just in my head, my mind was made up. It just made a lot of sense. I was just like, why isn't everybody doing this as much as they can? And I remember sitting in school and, and smoking pot before school and then sitting in class and looking, talking to the girl next to me and saying to her, you know, like, oh, I've been smoking pot. And she looked at me like, what the hell is wrong with you, kid? <laughs> and I remember looking at her like, what the hell is wrong with you? Why aren't you guys doing this? Yeah. And because I just felt so good. Uh, and it was less about, yeah, sure, the effect was good, but it was just that internally I could just be myself is the best way I could describe it. Um, and then from that point, I guess I just started using more regularly, more frequently, and it was it was fun. It was enjoyable. There weren't many, very many problems. You know, prior to that, I'd, I'd guess I'd been in trouble more than the average kid, you know, suspensions from primary school and sent home and, you know, like up at the principal's office all the time, but nothing you know, massively serious. Um, and a smoking pot just felt like the next thing. And I was hanging out with older kids that were doing that and involved in the, you know, kind of the world that goes with that. And I just thought that was really cool. And so I just made this decision that I was going to do it as much as I possibly could. And I began doing that. And then I remember a couple of key things kind of happening. One, I remember not having pot one day, maybe I was 14 at this stage. <laughs> running out and I didn't sleep and I saw the sun come up the next morning and I had to go to school and I remember being like why didn't I sleep that was weird and then it twigged I went oh it's because I didn't smoke oh okay I'm gonna make a commitment to myself that I'm never gonna run out again yeah and so this is where this is where I believe my thinking is a little bit different to the average Joe yeah because uh, I, my brain doesn't say, okay, maybe that's something you should address and stop smoking. You know, <laughs> my brain says, okay, I know how we solve this. We never run out again. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and I remember then trying to score with friends, like by, by about age 15, we started using speed and heroin. And uh, I remember waiting at a phone box back when we used to score at the phone box and waiting after school 
and you know the dealer says i'll be 10 minutes man i'll be 10 minutes man i'll be 10 minutes you know an hour passes and then it's, everyone's got to go home and they're like oh i remember my, my mates just saying to me mate we're going home like stuff and he's not coming and i just remember looking at them like no fucking chance like i'm not leaving this spot until he turns up because this is way more important than anything else in my life right now <laughs> and then so that was another experience where i went oh your thinking is probably not like these other kids um and so i began to be drawn towards other kids that kind of used the way i did and wanted to use you know made drugs the priority and when i did that other areas of my life started to fall apart like i was you know, for, for, you know, for a young fellow, reasonably good at football. Um, and I remember, you know, I was in rep teams and they wanted me to come and play on other particular teams and the coaches would come visit me or the other mates, the other players would come visit me and they'd send people to come and say, Anthony, what the fuck's going on? Why aren't you playing? And in my head, I was like, oh, I just, I, I, I'm too busy using, you know, <laughs> like I'm too busy using. Um <laughs> And so as a result of that, then, you know, getting into, I guess, the lifestyle that goes with it, hanging around with kids that were doing crime, getting involved in that kind of thing, started to get into trouble. Consequences started to kind of build up and I found myself more isolated from the normies, you know, and I found myself identifying more with, you know, the kids that were in trouble and the kids that were using drugs and the kids that were doing whatever they needed to do to get more of those drugs. And I guess I felt like I belonged there too. You know, I could use and not be judged. I could, um, you know, put that first and they would understand that and not look at me like I was a weirdo or, you know, a bad kid or a naughty kid. And so I, I sensed, I guess, in, in hindsight, I sensed some belonging there. And if I'm really honest, I probably thought it was kind of cool too. Yeah. You know, I, I found, I looked at, you know, some of the older kids and they were driving nice cars and had, you know, nice clothes and jewelry and women, and they didn't seem to work. They just hung out at the local shops. And I was like, why on earth wouldn't I want to do that? Like, <laughs> that, I've got status. It looks easy. They seem to be successful. And I look back now and my brain's like, it's like, wow, my, my thinking was quite warped. You know, like before we got on the call, you mentioned, you know, your own upbringing and saying like, wow, what were they thinking? Like, what was going on? Like, I kind of look back now and go, wow, what was I thinking? Like, I actually thought that was a solution. You know, and I actually thought that was the best way to live my life. Um, yeah. And so I guess the more I used, the more I did those things, the more separate from normal life I became, the more I identified. So for me, a really big thing is, and I've come to learn, is who I identify as. You know, who do I tell myself I am and who do I tell myself I'm not? Because who I identify as is going to determine everything else I do in the rest of my life. And I and so I remember, you know, just going, oh, I'm I'm an addict now. Like you're shooting up drugs, you know, you're using more often than you're not. You're using hard drugs now. Like, and I still wanted to. But the idea of stopping hadn't really come into my head. You know, I was getting in more trouble and I believed that it was the other people's fault. It was the people that told on me or it was the police's fault or it was this person's fault or that person's fault. It wasn't me and it certainly wasn't my drug use. Um, I remember getting into my late teens and uh, getting locked up and detoxing and landing there and just having a realisation. Uh, I remember just sitting there in the cell and realising, oh, for the first time ever, I remember realizing, oh, okay, it's the drugs, mate. Like, you know, that's why you're here, you know, <laughs> like it's the drugs. It's not because of them or this or that or whatever. Like it's the drugs got there. And I remember making a decision then. I remember for the first time, seriously, you know, I'd been to, you know, recovery groups and I'd been, you know, recommended things and I'd been in programs through court ordered stuff, you know, the whole time. But it was all a bit of a joke. I've got to go tick the box to get through the order. Yep. Um, and, and so I remember making this decision, okay, I'm done. That's it. This time I'm serious. I'm fair income. I'm fucking done. <laughs> and I was sitting there and I think it was maybe six or seven days later, bloke turned up at my door, said, there's gear going around. Do you want some? I didn't even think about my answer. I just said, yes. You know, just said yes, used. Um, at the time, I didn't have hepatitis C. You know, I didn't have any diseases. Used this, you know, 
in a way that probably guaranteed that. And I remember sitting there, you know, three hours later going, what the fuck is wrong with you, mate? Like you weren't hanging out, you weren't detoxing, you know, like you, there's no reason for you to have used today, you know, yet the moment it was put in front of you, you, you couldn't say no. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, segue to that is I never actually ended up contracting hep C. I don't know how, I don't know how, cause I continued to use. And I take that as some sort of divine intervention because I absolutely couldn't believe it from that. I was certain anyway. Um, and so I guess from that point, mate, I just made a decision that, okay, well, I'm just going to, this is part of who I am now. I can't stop. I'm, I'm hopeless. Um, and I'm completely powerless over this drug. So I'm just going to try and live my life in a way where I can support this drug habit and stay out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and as you know most people share it just got worse you know my using got worse my i became less manageable in my life overdoses started happening different attempts at getting clean started to happen so things like you know psychology psychiatry uh methadone program subutex program i got a couple of now trexone implants sewn into my guts and every time i'd have them i would just end up using other drugs you know, I'd switch to ice or speed or wasabi or, or pills or all of the above at one time. And uh, like, I just remember just getting to, like, I just wanted to exit life. You know, I didn't want to die at that stage, but I just wanted to not be here. And it wasn't like back in high school where, you know, I used and everything was great. It was like, I'm just never getting to this point. You know, I'm just never getting to this point that I want to get to where I feel at peace anymore. You know, I remember, I remember one time scoring off a, a guy that I, I used to score off this Vietnamese bloke, couldn't speak English properly. And he pulled up in a van, pulled open the back of the van. He's sitting there smoking because, you know, he wasn't a junkie because he smoked it. Guy's whole face was blue. Lips were like bright blue from the, all the foil because um, he smoked all day long. And I remember him saying to me, he goes, oh, he goes, once you start chasing the dragon, you're never going to catch it. You know, it was like what he said to me in like half English and, um, and he was right. You know, that's what the experience was like. Now it was like, I was constantly seeking this relief in the drugs that I could never find. And no matter how much I use, I could never reach the place that I was trying to get to. And so with that started to become, I get a, I guess, a real sense of hopelessness, a real sense of sadness, a real sense of despair. You know, I'd become more destructive, more reckless burnt my life to the ground. All the things I said I'd never do, I began doing. All the behaviors that I thought were beneath me, I began doing. Um, and the results were less and less and less, you know? Uh, a typical fucking garden variety story, you know? Um, and like I said, there'd been many times in the past where I probably should have stopped, you know, consequences in my life where I should have stopped. Uh, um, but this the time I got clean, I it was just like internally there wasn't anything left in the tank, you know. My life, my day consisted of. I remember I'd wake up, I'd drink VB cans, I'd go to like a box of the thirty cans, I'd drink VB cans as soon as I woke up, pop a couple of Xanax, go walk to the toilet, throw up, because I don't really know what that was, but I'd be sick and just be like dry reaching, throwing up. Um, you know, hopefully keep it down before the pills kicked in so I didn't have to take more. I'd then go get my methadone dose. I was on the highest legal dose of methadone um, at the end of the street. Uh, and then use, you know, if I didn't have drugs, I'd go get drugs to use. And I'd go home and I was really scared. My life was very small. You know, in my head, I wanted to be this fucking rock star. But, mate, I was watching, I remember I'd watch Murder, She Wrote, reruns on Foxtel and uh, Monk. I don't know if you know Monk, that detective show, just shit, shit TV. And that would be my daily routine because they were on, it was about 11 o'clock and it was 12 o'clock and that was about the time that I'd woken up and done those little things and I'd watch those shows and try and just reach this place that I never got to reach. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and that, so that was, and, and I guess what I was saying is I got to a point where I was like, I just can't do this anymore. Like, I don't want to kill myself, but I don't want to be living. Yeah. 
yeah um and and i could sense the end was near too i was overdosing more regularly you know i was um i don't know i'm, I'm sure you i'm sure you, you you get it um and i know other people relate to it too but it's like i could feel death was kind of near you know i could feel it's almost like i could feel in the air which is yeah. it's weird but like i knew that was coming um and so I decided to, I guess, surrender, you know, and just say, okay, I'm fucked. I can't do this anymore. I don't know how to change. I don't believe I can change. Evidence suggests that every time I say I'm going to use, I end up doing it. But today I'm just fucked and I've had enough, you know. Um, and I went to a detox and they wouldn't touch me. They wouldn't touch the pills and they wouldn't touch the methadone. And they were like, this is too much. Like we're not, we're not fucking with that, but we'll detox you off the heroin. We'll detox you off the alcohol. And then you can go somewhere else to do that. And they ended up kicking me out within, I don't know, two weeks or something because of my behavior. And I remember leaving there and they gave me this big pile of pills <clears throat> on the way out. And I put them in the, the plastic wrapper of my cigarette packet. And they said, you need to take these pills. If you don't, you're probably going to have seizures chance you can die. Yeah. And I just knew, again, there's something inside of me, man, just said, like, if you take these pills, this whole thing is going to start again. You know, this whole addiction thing is going to start again and you'll just be out of control and the end is near. And so I didn't do that. I um, I wrapped them up and I put them in my pocket and I was like, I just know if I take start taking the pills again, I'm going to be in trouble um, outside of the facility. And so I went to a recovery group and um, began the process of recovery. Yeah, um, I don't really remember much. I was still still on methadone um, and I began reducing off the methadone and it took a while, but I, and, 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 you know, like you said before the call, like it, it took probably took me nine months to, of not using anything other than the methadone to prescribed by the doctor to reduce down uh to a to a level where they would admit me into another detox and actually deal with it and uh yeah i remember i remember everyone saying oh you know my head's really loud my head's really busy like i have all these insecurities and all these doubts and all this you know madness that goes on between my ears I was like i don't relate to that i don't know what you guys are talking about until i got off the methadone <laughs> and actually got clean <laughs> And then it was just like, what the fuck? Like my head was just so loud and I was so insecure and I was so full of fear and I didn't, I couldn't, I remember asking people, I don't even know how to dress. I don't even know what I like to eat. Like, I don't even know, like I needed to know how to live, you know, like, and I'd been identifying with this world, which wasn't really who I am, yeah. you know? Um, and yeah, man. And so what happened? I had to, you know, they say in recovery circles, like they only have to change one thing and that's everything. Mm. And yeah. I remember hearing it and being like, like, they say, there's only one thing you need to change. And I was like, oh, tell me, tell me, what is it? Like, give me a shortcut, any yeah. shortcut, take it, you know? And he was like, you need to change everything. And I was like, fuck you, mate. <laughs> but then he was right. You know, he was right. Like I had to change everything. The people I hung around with, the person I identified as mostly, I believe I needed to change, like who I see myself as, who I am, yep. you know, the words I put after the words I am is most important because if the, the word person I was, was hundred percent going to use again and, and, you know, end up dying. But when I started to change that to, I am someone who doesn't use, I am someone who values health. I am someone, you know, who honors himself. I am someone who faces fear instead of retreating, you know, I am someone who stays clean. Like that's when things began to change. Yeah. And so it, um, you know, I've, I've been clean now for 14 years. Um, and uh, people, I've seen people that I used with on the street and they don't recognize me. I was like really overweight. I was obese. Um, I certainly wasn't, you know, healthy. <laughs> I didn't talk like I do today. Yeah. You know, I, I walked differently. And I really remember there was a period where, uh, in the early years where, you know, if you see someone on the street that does the same sort of stuff you do, you can spot them, you know, you can pick them and you see the way they dress and the way they're carrying themselves and the things they're doing. I'll see other people that were using and 
and I could spot them a mile away. And for, there was a period there where they kind of look at me like, kind of like, are you one of me or are you not? Like, you know, like, are you one of us or are you not? And I don't get that anymore. But I remember there was a distinct period there where it was. And so for me, what I'm trying to articulate is that I, the person I was needed to change. You know, the thoughts that I thought, the beliefs that I, the things that I believed, the actions that I was taking, the places I was hanging around, the things that I valued, all that shit needed to change. And as that did change, I changed. And then my thinking changed. And then, you know, a lot of that stuff began to get resolved. Yeah. Uh, um, and mate, it's not easy, but it's, it, but it's, but using wasn't easy either, you know? Um, and these days it's like, like, I just, uh, I, I, I'm just so grateful. I see people that drink, you know, regularly, socially, whatever. And I see a lot of people that wouldn't identify as having a problem who still struggle with, you know, whether it be alcohol or, you know, social drug use. And I, there was nothing social about my drinking or using, but I just go, oh, like, I just don't even want that in my life. You know, and people ask me, do you have cravings or do you ever miss it or whatever? And I'm like, honestly, no. Like, I honestly, I, I just, I've got a life now. And I think what was really important is building a life where uh, my, my life is so, you know, kind of good and fulfilling and rewarding that I don't need to escape it and I don't need a, a drug to avoid, you know, the way I feel about myself. And I needed to like myself enough to not want to suppress that. And I need to feel safe in my own skin to a degree where I don't need something else to kind of numb that or, or change that. And that was really, I believe, really critical and really key. Because if I didn't have that, I, I believe my mind would probably still be going back to, well, you can use that and this will fix that. You know, if you take a drug, it'll fix that. If you have a drink, you, you know, you won't have the social anxiety or whatever it might be. Yep. You know, I needed to become a person who didn't have those things and work on that from the inside. Um, so, yeah. And I guess, mate, a, a, another thing that's important for me to share is like, I, you know, pe people say, you know, you, oh, you got clean, what an awesome job. What a, that, That's great. That's fantastic. And, you know, I appreciate that. And I guess it really did take something, but for me, I also, I personally feel like I owe a bit of a debt. You know, I'm really, I'm, I'm really grateful to have been able to get clean. I'm really grateful to change my life, but I didn't get clean to just live an average life now, yeah. you know, like I, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I just feel like, oh, I've just got so much to fucking give and I've got so much to achieve. And, you know, I feel like I have a purpose, which has been put inside of me from, you know, something greater than myself to actually help people, you know, do that stuff that I'm talking about around changing their identity, around, um, you know, changing their beliefs, around becoming the best version of themselves. Because I, I believe that stuff's really important. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we, I kind of do now for a job. Yep. yep. Is I've got a business where we teach people to, to be what we call higher powered humans you know, connected to something greater themselves, but also being the best version of themselves in all areas of their life, in their body, in their mindset, and then also in their spirit or soul. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I asked you to come on the podcast because I'm really choosy who I bring on the podcast is I want people who are here to give. Yep. Yeah, I mean, as I said to you before, <laughs> when I was a drug addict or drinking or whatever it was, I always say I was a human taking. Yeah. Now I'm a human being. So and good. Being a human being has a great responsibility. Because mm. to be something, you have to project. You have to um, front up. You have to pay the price. And mm. paying the price for me is paying it forward. What yeah. was given to me has to be given back. I feel I'm obligated Exactly. The message of recovery. I believe I have a great responsibility to carry a message and I have to carry a message of positivity, of love and kindness <laughs> and generosity. Yep. That's why I asked you to come on the program because I've known you now for nearly 11 years. Mm. I mean, you, you were a young fellow when I met you and um, I've watched you grow. Yeah. And I've watched you flourish and see because... I always say to people, don't listen to what I say, watch what I do. Yeah. Because, mate, the best comment in the world 
can talk shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you can't con a con. Correct. You know what I mean? And you know yourself, as soon as someone starts telling us bullshit, our little bullshit oh. goes off, it's like, please, motherfucker, I wrote totally. that book. Totally. You know, yeah. I wrote that book, motherfucker, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I looked at the bottom. It's got a copyright on the end of that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's my IP. <laughs> yeah, that's my IP, motherfucker, you know. But, um, yeah, man, geez, you brought us some shit. You know, methadone, that was what I came off, the last drug I came off. Yeah, and I was right. just a little bit, I was a little bit luckier than you, I guess, because I I came off that cold turkey in 1986 Fuck. when the detox units didn't know how bad it was. <laughs> like, oh yeah, because I'd, I'd been around a long time. I'd been around for five years, and they knew me. Mm. I went to the detox, you know, because I'd worked in rehab and that. And they're like, "Oh, you know what you're doing, Ron?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm just cold turkey." What a wow. nightmare! Yeah, After wow. day ten, I got sick. Yeah, wow. I never got sick for ten days. I was on 120 mil. Yeah, well, that's that. What's the dose I was on? Yeah, like ah, this is nothing. What are they whinging about? Oh. You know, oh. I remember ringing my spiritual advisor. <laughs> Six days into it, saying, This is a piece of piss. This is nothing. I read, <laughs> I read him on day nine and said, I'm dying. I'm, I'm actually going to pass away. You're going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, left, I left that detox and I went to an emergency, St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, and presented at the emergency section and said, I need to see a doctor. They said, What's wrong with you? I said, I'm dying. <laughs> and they're like, What? I said, No, I'm dying. I'm, I'm going to die in about the next hour. I'll, I'll die. I wow. said, what is wrong with you? I said, well, I'm coming up 120 mil of methadone. They said, we can't help you. Yeah. You're going to have to go back on methadone. And I was so desperate because I'd been clean. Oh, wow. I wasn't going back on methadone. I knew that wow. if I kept on withdrawing, I would get better. Wow. I knew that if I went back to active, active addiction, I'd get worse. Wow. And, and I had that momently lapse of reason where I realized that I'd rather go through the pain and get well than stay in the pain and die. Wow. Because the joy had gone. You talked about it. The joy of, of taking a chemical and putting a chemical into my body to mm. change the way I feel had, mm. had stopped working. Yeah. You, know, you hear people okay. saying, what the hell are you talking about, you know? Mm -hmm. Your your story is very similar to mine in so many ways that I was a poly drug user. Yeah. I would use anything. Totally. Totally. I'm on the day and I'm going to shoot up some speed. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get over this fucker. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The ice detox. I'm changing. <laughs> yeah, I'm. There was no ice when I was lucky. It was speed, but you know, speed detox. I'm, yeah. I'm changing this fucker. I'm getting over this fucker. You know what I mean? Yeah. What do you mean you can't get over methadone? Give me some barbiturates. I'll shoot that shit up. You know, I'll get over that. You know? Yeah. And so the beautiful part for me was that <clears throat> you touched on it. Once you gave up the drugs, that's when the games began. Mm. That's when the chatter came. Oh. In the mind, and I learned that for me, I learned that addiction you put drugs in front of it, mm. has got nothing to do with what I was going through. I was going through my mental health, was my issue, my mm. belief systems, my core values, my core thinkings were my issues. Not the drug, the drugs was a symptom that my issues were so fucking deeply rooted that I had yeah. to change the way I thought. I had to change the way I acted. I had to change the way I reacted. Yeah. Because my thoughts, actions, and reactions were really, really screwed up. Totally, mate. So totally. I had to, and today we can talk about it because it's 2023. I had to reprogram my thinking. When I was a kid and I got clean, we said, you're trying to fucking brainwash me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I mean, yeah. now we understand that it's reprogramming. Yeah. We used to call it brainwashing when we were kids, you know, because we were so ignorant and arrogant. And I got a mate of mine who he, he died in, in active addiction. He, he was a drug and alcohol cancer for a little while, and he never stayed clean. And another mate of mine, he's in detox with me. He goes, Ah, oh, you're trying to fucking brainwash me. And my mate that said that was a real smart ass, Wayne. And my other mate was a bigger smart ass, Brad. And he goes, Wayne, if I want to wash your brain, I'd spit on a tissue. That's how big, <laughs> <laughs> that's how big your fucking brain is to that. <laughs> you're in detox. You've got no brain, you know. Yeah, I could just yeah, you're fucking nowhere. Yeah, I can spit on a tissue to wash your brain, you know, you fucking brain's that small. Ironic part of the story is I 12 step, I helped Wayne get clean 39 years ago. I relapsed and I detoxed on his lounge. Wow. 
So, you know, that's why I say to sometimes, you know, be nice to the newcomer. 100%. This might be helping you one day. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's a beautiful story, mate. But the thing that I'm more impressed about you is the man you've grown to be. You're a father. You're a husband. Yeah. You're a human being. You're a lifestyle coach. Yeah. You're a very healthy man. You think you, you, you not only have you helped your brain, you've helped your body and you helped your spirit. Yeah. No, I was going to say, you touched on that before. Like you touched on the, um, you know, w- when I came off the dome and when you came off the dome, the head started to go really mad. And you, you're right. That is when the work really did start, you know? And so for me, it was like my head started and it said, okay, because I was overweight. And my head said, all right, well, I remember detoxing off, you know, dear friend of mine, one of my best mates that, you know, introduced me to you, Scott, detoxing there. And I remember they said about, you know, write write your worldly goals list. They used to say that in rehab. So I wrote the the list and I was like, okay, I want to one day, oh, first of all, I want to be able to sleep. Yeah. Couldn't sleep. Second, I wanted to maybe one day own a car, any car. Third, I want to one day maybe get a job, be employable. And fourth, get a girlfriend. That was it. That was a goals list. And then I remember I was overweight and I didn't like the way I looked and I was really self-conscious of that. And so my head said, okay, if you just lose weight and you look good, then you're going to be able to attract a chick and then you'll feel like you're enough, you know? (laughs) And so obsessively like just researched that, you know, learn about nutrition, eating, food, training. I I couldn't sleep coming off the dome. So I'll go running at like one or two in the morning. Yeah. yeah, and then and like seriously, and I remember running and seeing people. Uh, I'll never forget running Kangaroo Point and seeing blokes like carrying TVs down the street at three in the morning, <laughs> thinking that I'm about to pinch them. And I was like, "Oh, you're right, mate. Keep going. You know, I'm just going for my run." Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, and that was like another fork in the road moment. Anyway, my point was, I did that, and then. And it was like, it wasn't enough, you know? And so then I was like, went on this bodybuilding journey and I, and I started training and started to look, you know, again, if I just look better and if I can win a show and then I won a, you know, heavyweight Mr. Queensland title. And I remember standing there being like, fuck, is this it? You know, I want more, I want more. And so then I, I lost the way. And so then I want to get a job and start making money. If I start earning X amount of money, then I'll be happy. And that wasn't enough. And then if I get some staff and that wasn't enough, and it was just like this constant chasing outside of myself, you know, like you said, the addiction wasn't just the drugs. It's this constant seeking something outside of myself to fix the way I feel on the inside. And that was a really pivotal shift for me, mate, where I went from just like, if I get all the outsides right, everything will be okay what i found is that i have to get the insides right like you were saying what i think about myself how i how i identify how i carry myself like what i'm doing all of that shit my values <laughs> being kind to myself never heard of that never thought of that never even considered it you know like speaking yeah. nice to myself fucking hell yeah. like big one change my life you know um and, 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 you know, which brings me to today, which is where I believe for me, like in that, that giving back thing you're talking about, like, I believe it is possible to kind of have it all, you know, I do want, I do like external things. I do want success. I do want to provide a great life for my family. I do want a business that's well-known that helps thousands of people. Um, and I dedicate my life to achieving those things. However, I don't believe that I'm going to be happy when, you know, I don't believe that I'm going to somehow be enough if that happens. Yep. Like, and that's the spiritual thing that you you touched on. That's the spiritual part. So we get the mind right. We get the body right. I've also got to get the spirit right and realize, oh, I'm enough as I am today. I'm actually not the smart ass that's come up with this idea. There's, there's the spiritual part of me that's led me here, that wants me to give, that wants me to help. And when I stay connected to that, I fucking get everything I want. I get to achieve the outside life that I want, but I also get to feel bloody good about myself in the process. I get to feel content. I get, I get you know, content. What the fuck? I never even knew that existed. Yeah. You know, like, I never even knew that existed. Um, you, and you like, can use drugs to make yourselves content. 100%. 100%. And at best, it was momentary. At best. And that stopped working. 100%. Everyone says it, you know, like, I heard a guy share, and the guy, I really love him, and he struggled so badly. He's, I think he's back out there on the ice again. He said, um, you, the joy went out of my using. 
And when he said it was like a revelation, and I'd been clean 34, 35 years when he said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm like, I've probably heard it a million times, but it just resignated that day. The joy went out of the using. I thought, fuck it, yeah, it did. Yep. The joy. The joy. Yep. Because part of the joy was the getting in ways and means to get more. Hmm. That was part of the joy too. Totally. I didn't know it. That was part hmm. of my disease. Big time. That was part of my addiction. Yep. Then when that became boring and the drug stopped <clears> working <throat> and I was using against my will, horrible place to be. Mm. When you have an awareness and you have a information and you're still using against your will, that's the most painful thing I've ever experienced. You know, I've sat in prison. I got sentenced to 18 years, as you know, when I was 16 years clean. And when I came downstairs and I sat in the cell, I still knew I was going to be okay. Mm. And yet when I was using, I never felt okay. Never. I never felt okay. Mm. I never felt it's going to be all right. <laughs> I was always fearful of running out tomorrow. Yeah. I never had enough. Yeah. And today I have an abundance. Yeah. Today I have, I, sometimes I get embarrassed about what I've achieved. Mm. That sounds funny, but that's part of the addict, I guess. Sometimes I'm embarrassed about my achievements because, you mm. know, I have people talking to me, telling me nice things about me. <clears throat> That's uncomfortable for me. Totally. Call me an asshole. Call me a fucking criminal. Call me a grub. <laughs> yeah, I can handle yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are loving. You know, I, as I said, I, I did an interview with a woman this morning who's fifty something years sober, and she said to me, "I wanted to come on." She she approached me. She said, "I wanted to come on your podcast, Ronnie, because I love what you do." Yeah, wow. Well. Because I love how many people you help. Yeah, and I know your story because she's followed me. And she knows about my prison story. She knows about me having a rehab in prison. She knows all that stuff. She goes, the stuff you've done, no one can do. Mm, mm. She said, you know, you're, and she said to me, she's a, I think she's a very religious, not religious, spiritual person. She said, you were chosen to do the job because you could do the job. Yeah. And that made me uncomfortable. Yeah. But it was the truth. It's the truth, man. Yeah, it is the truth. You know, I was chosen. And yeah. I, now I'm, I'm grateful for the, for the choices that my higher power made for me. You got it. Because today I am who I am because of where I came from. I, don't, I no longer hold resentment to my past <clears throat> or shame or guilt or remorse. Mm. Because you hear these, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be politically correct here. These <laughs> days of social media, yeah. so many gurus on here talking about stuff, and I don't know where their qualifications come from. I just really don't know where they call it. You know, I've got a 24 year old bike telling me about relationships. Mm. I've been married five times. You're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I'm probably a better, a better person on relationships than anybody. Cause I've been through so many of them and they failed. And I've learned something every time I've failed. Yeah. I believe people in recovery talk about self-motivation, talk about self-help are the ones that are the ones most qualified to talk about it. Yeah. hundred percent. It's, um, I agree. I, um, man, I liken it to, uh, there was a, there's a book written about it, but I think it was the 1996 British rowing team. It's a famous kind of story. So forgive me if you've heard it, but they were basically doing really poorly, the British rowing team. And they were just the laughing stock of the, the whole British Olympic team. They're like, these guys can't do anything right. They're never going to win a medal. They're rubbish. Um, and they were training for the 2000 Olympics and they were like, okay, how are we going to, Pull this off like how we, like we've got to do better with the laughing stock of our country we've got to get our shit together there's four blokes in the team and they basically at the start of the training camp for the four years they sat down and they came up with this concept this idea where they said for the next four years we're going to base our entire life and our entire thinking and every single decision we make around one question is this going to get me closer to winning a gold medal or further away right yeah. So am I going to skip training? Am I going to sleep in? Am I going to go sleep over my girlfriend's house? Am I going to eat that piece of cake? Whatever. Yeah. Based all around, is doing this action going to get me closer or further away from the gold medal? Now you can see where it's going. They obviously ended up killing it and winning gold at the 2000 Olympics. And it was amazing. And they attributed that to their success. And what I say to people who are trying to get clean or wanting to get clean or wanting to achieve anything great in their life is like that's what it takes to win a gold medal 
you know, and give yourself 110%. And I also believe that's what it takes to get clean. Yep. You know, and when I first heard that story, I ultimately related because that was the first time I'd ever tried that in my life, but that's exactly what I did. Yep. And that's what it took. And you've seen this thousands of times more than me. It's like the blokes and the, and the women, but the people that stay clean are the ones that go, I'm really willing to do whatever it fucking takes you know for an undefined amount of time until i get exactly what you're talking about which is freedom from this yep. you know and and so i i see people that get clean and, and that's a message i have for them and and us is that mate we've done what it takes to win a fucking gold medal exactly. emotionally you know what i mean like it's pretty special yeah. and oh, it's mate. pretty cool and it's worthy of being acknowledged we are we are blessed we're chosen, but we've done the work. Correct. And I say to everybody, recovery doesn't come by osmosis. It comes from hard work. 100%. If you want more than the guy sitting beside you, do more than what he does. Yeah. He works 40 hours a week as a butcher, and you're a butcher. Work 60 hours a week. Yeah. If he gets up at 4, you get up at 3.30. Yeah. You know, yeah. If he does 100 laps of the pool, you do 105. Yeah. And that's what my life's been about. You know, I've been so blessed my whole life with the choices I make. Even even the, when I was a naughty boy, I was still blessed. I still made choices, and I, I'm not a victim. I've never you, you've never you've known me for long. You never hear me whinge about nothing. I mm. never go like, oh poor me, you know, like mm. oh, I was a victim. It's it's not who I am. Everything I do, I do one million percent. Mm. Everything I have, I have earned. But I also believe I had divine intervention guiding me. 100%. Because if 100%. you do the right thing, the right thing comes back to you. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, and, you, and you're right. Like, you never had that, you know, life's happening to me. I'm a palace victim of this whole circumstance thing, which uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, particularly in recovery, with, there's enough evidence or trying to get recovery, there's enough evidence in their lives to run that story. Poor yeah. me, this happened when I was a kid, or that happened, or this didn't happen, and you know, whatever. And and it's a killer, mate. You yeah. know, it's, it's a flat out killer. Can I ask you a question? Yes, mate. Do you believe, you know, you mentioned the divine intervention thing and, and being divinely led, and I 100 percent agree. I'm I'm deeply spiritual, non-religious, but deeply spiritual. Yep. And I believe in that too. Um, do you believe everyone has access to that? I do. Or is it, or is it that only, only uh, there are only a chosen few? I uh, believe everybody has good and bad inside of them. Yep. And I believe that is just for me. Yeah. My choice to recognize it. And I also believe it was my choice to grasp it and to nurture it. I knew that I wasn't a bad person my whole life, even though I acted badly. Mm, mm, even when I was a really, really naughty kid, I knew that there was something inside me that was good. Mm, yeah, I wow. didn't acknowledge it, and I thought it was a weakness. I thought goodness was a weakness. Wow. I believe everybody's got good. And I know mass murderers. I know psychopaths. <laughs> I know lots of horrible, horrible people because I spent a long time in prisons. Sure. Sometimes if I questioned those people, it was never their heart that I questioned. It was their brain. You'll hear me say sometimes, got a heart of gold, got a head of spaghetti. Wow. And I believe the brain is the enemy to the to humans. Yeah, wow. The human brain is our biggest enemy. Not our heart, not mm. our soul. Mm. Yeah. Cool. And I believe people who are, who are psychopaths, and I'm not a psychologist, and I, but I, yeah. I, should, I should be for all the years I've spent in places. Um, it's our brain that tells us to kill somebody, not our heart. Wow. Yeah, brain that tells us to self-harm. I have a question I ask everybody. Yep. <clears throat> when people suicide, mm. what's the most common way of killing themselves? Hanging themselves? I don't know. Putting a gun to their head? Why don't they shoot themselves in the heart? Wow. wow. Noise up. They're trying to disconnect their head from their body. They wow. can't take the brain anymore, so they try to separate the brain from the fucking body. And that's from my... And I've seen a lot of people kill themselves in prisons. Everyone that hung themselves was trying to stop their brain. Their head. 
I spoke yeah. to guys in the morning that have hung themselves over lunch. Wow. People I know that have shot themselves in the head have tried to stop the noise. That is shit. There's yeah, your heart. You never head. hear that. You never hear that. You never hear anyone shooting themselves in the heart. They always shoot themselves in the head. Why? Because of the noise. The wow. chatter. The chatter. And if you that's really deep what I'm saying. If you get into that, you and No, you, I get that. That lands, mate. Like that fully lands. And I I hundred percent agree. I think the mind is this the cause of pretty well all of our problems. The nature oh. of the mind has been cause of all of our, those problems. No. And, yeah, that's amazing. And if you get into, you know, which I don't, um, and which I should, but I don't, um, when I was more into the health, and, you know, I'm also 68 years of age, when I was fully into fitness and everything else, and I always ate really carefully, and I ate, you know, people always talked about, you know, nurturing the heart and the soul, but your mind has to be focused. And as you said before, if we deviate from the mind, we we suffer physically. Correct. If you don't do that extra lap and you sleep in, you eat some of that shit, the next day you wake up, you physically so your mind is controlling your physiology. Mm. Your mind is controlling what's going on with you in your heart. So mm. my my belief is that I've handed my will, which is my mind. Yes. My spiritual advisor. So good. That's you know. I'm 37 years clean in a couple of weeks yeah. and about three, four months ago, I have a discussion. My wife and I had two arguments in, in 11 years, both were my fault. And both <laughs> were out of my own personal insecurity. Oh, that's, man. <laughs> that's the truth. We've had two fights, like fights. Yeah. yeah. The other, the other month, my wife was having a hard time. I should have, I should have noticed it, but I was being self-centered. Mm -hmm. She's frustrated with our little girl. She's two and a half. She's three now. Sure. And my wife goes, fucking, she's pissing me off, this little fucking bitch. And I go, don't call my wife, don't call my don't call our child a bitch. You know, I'm I'm being the the man, you know? Yeah. So I go ring, I go away and I go, you know, it's fucked. You shouldn't do that. And I go around and ring up my spiritual advisor. I go, hey man, this is me, you know, blah, 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 blah. This is what happened, because I'm really honest with my spiritual advisor. And he lets me talk. Let's me finish. And he goes, are you fucking serious? <laughs> you know, he goes, mate, you're so far off fucking centre. It's not funny. Because I said to my wife, I'm the breadwinner of this house. Look after the kid, you know, like just chauvinistic male yeah. Yeah, fucking yeah. shit. Yeah, 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 got it. And then my spiritual advisor said, mate, you're <clears> fucked. <throat> you need to go and fucking apologise to your wife and make yeah. amends. And he said, don't you see what she just did? She just asked you for help. Wow. Beautiful. She just asked you for help and you were too fucking self-centered to see it. And 35, 36, or 36 and a half years clean. And I went in and I said, Bobby, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm fucking, I was being ignorant and arrogant and I apologize. And then I went and got my little girl and I bathed her and looked after her and, and I, I made a conscious effort for the next few days to take the load off my wife. All my wife was saying was, I'm not coping, honey, I need help. Exactly. Yeah, wow. You know, and that's 36 years clean. Mm. So, you know, I still hand my my will over to him and I you know, I run stuff past him. Mate, I don't have that many issues, just to being honest. I don't have that much drama. I don't I don't do silly things, so I get silly results. Exactly. I, I don't entertain bullshit in my own brain, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mate, if I think about shoplifting long enough, I'll put something up my shirt. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. don't think about it. Exactly. Entertain it. I never entertain you using. That's not even an option. Um, you know, lust, I had to put that on the program. Try, I might put that on the program. I put a lot of things on the program. And when I say put on the program is I don't entertain. I don't test. Because if you think of the whole idea of a test is, it's win and lose. Mm. I'm already mm. winning. I'm already winning. What, already the winning. I, what, have, what the fuck have I got to test? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Love I can that. only lose. Yeah, 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 beautiful. For me to put a test in front of myself, I can <laughs> only lose. Setting yourself up to lose. Yeah. You can't, if I'm winning, how can I, the only option to winning is losing. So if I don't test myself, I'm just going to stay winning. Yeah. I thought of Charlie Sheen when I said that because Charlie went on that winning. I sent him an email the other day. I hope he gets back to me. Yeah. Because I had a little bit to do with him years ago. Yeah, wow. Funny, you know, I'm trying to get him to do a podcast with me actually. Amazing. Yeah. So, 
He used to take the piss out of me about being in recovery. <laughs> then he got clean for a year and he said it was the most boring year of his life. Now he's back in recovery. He's starting to spruik about it. So I've sent a message. It's hard to get through to him because um he's got so many buffers between him. Sure. I've sure. contacted a mate of mine in America and sent, said send him an email through his PA and see if he'll come on the put him on podcast with me. Wow. That'd be amazing. Yeah, but no more amazing than you, my friend. No more amazing than you. Thank you, man. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Because you know that's the greatest gift you can give somebody is time. Most valuable resource, right? We can't make more of it, mate. We can't steal it. We can't buy it. We can't make more of it. So, you know, thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. That's from the truth about addictions. What's your business, mate? Do you want to give it a plug? Awakenedlifestyles.com.au or at Anthony Inner Work on Instagram. All right, check him out, guys. He's doing really good stuff and he's got a really good heart. His motivation is 100%. I solemnly swear that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God.